is poetry the only form of writing that you still practice today? Because your last book was from 2006 of Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are still writing, still today, but is it only poetry and essays, or mm -hmm. will you maybe still write a theater play? Um, <clears throat> I don't think one ever completely stops writing, uh, composing. Let's put it this way, you may decide in the end, ah, oh, I've written something similar, others have, and probably done it better. But I don't think that one day, or maybe just one week, maybe three days, actually go by without one composing something. Not everything gets put down on paper. But there's just so much of a human tumult around one that uh, we never stop writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this this one, The Humanist. Um, one of the most famous books in, in Flanders, at least in Belgium, because it has been translated uh, into Dutch, was Ake, on mm -hmm. your youth, where you talk about your um, upbringing in a Christian household. Um, your mother, you nicknamed her the Wild Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, your father uh, was, a, was the headmaster of an Anglican school. Mm -hmm. um, when you, th when you write about religion here in the poem, but also in your last book, uh, you say that maybe we are better off without religion. Uh, religion is not supposed to help humanity. Let's just get rid of it all the way. Mm. Uh, I, I summarily yeah, summarize, I, I, but yes. that's I, Oh, I've said it even stronger, more strongly than that. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are moments when um, I feel that th there are enough what I call organic problems in human society, you know, and the human indi individual, issues of psychological makeup, uh, issues, concrete issues like uh, feeding millions, etc. cetera, uh, enough nature disasters which numb us and then we overcome them. It's just enough problems without religion adding to them. And uh, the others, there's nothing much you can do about. But religion at least can be controlled. It can be placed under check. Unfortunately, it's, it's made, it, it, it's just become um, a, a, giant, a giant obstacle, an instrument of oppression. I've seen places where re religion actually destroys the mind. I mean, everybody has seen it, though they may not put it down to religion. They might put it down to uh, social alienation, psychological warp, but then how did the human psychology get warped in the first place? And uh, I have watched brilliant people who've been just captured by religion and uh, given up the potential of themselves as individuals, including their potential contribution to society, saying, ah, They've been so brainwashed, so indoctrinated, that they feel that even human, I'm looking at extremes now, that, that even achievement, they feel it's a sin. I mean, we said, I've seen brilliant young people, they said, ah, no, I realize that all this, uh, what they call my talent and my brilliance, etc., etc., is all put there by Satan so that I will abandon God. It's, it's as crude as that. And it is that same kind of mentality that animates the murderous extremists that we encounter today, the Boko Haramis, the Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, uh, Taliban, etc., etc. In some cases, yes, motivated genuinely by wanting to elevate the human being. But most of the time, they are fixated outside actuality, and they feel it is all right to destroy living humanity completely to pave the way for, for other in eternal uh, residents in the afterlife or else the arrival of one messiah or the other in the world. And I think those people are sick, you know, such people who, who think that it's okay to destroy humanity because of their vision of eternity. I think they're sick and humanity must take a really strong stand. Now, that is not to uh, deny the contributions of religion to the world. Uh, the aesthetics uh, of architecture, which have been absolutely inspired by a religious feeling, nobody can deny that. 
as music, which have been the result of some inner you know, communion with some unknown uh, deity or super, uh, superhuman uh, entity or environment, just the imagination, human mm -hmm. imagination. But I wish they would all be told that, uh, be taught that the, it's their own inner, the, the, an inner core of creativity that produced these only from a track which we call religious piety, religious devotion, etc., etc. That way, religion is benign. Uh, because, I cannot deny that. Because you call yourself religious person too, or at least spiritual. Do I call myself? Religious, or at least spiritual. Oh, I say spiritual, yeah. I distinguish between spirituality and religion. I think all human beings have a certain aspect of, of themselves where they ask. I call it my philosophical side of themselves, where they ask, uh, why am I here? Uh, how did the first being come to be? Uh, what's the purpose? What's my purpose on earth? And they, they are not satisfied with the concrete, uh, the concrete productivity. They feel that it must be towards a certain direction which they are not equipped to see. Uh, and so spirituality is on various levels, but spirituality is mostly benign. It's personal, it's interior. You resolve your questions, or you don't resolve them, you know. You just use that very basis of uncertainty to communicate with others and to produce, and you know, uh, just heighten the level of existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in your books, uh, Dance of the Forest is one example uh, in other Africa, you put the Yoruba religion at the front, saying to the world, here's the answer. I mean, you write, literally you write, human, um, humanity could benefit from African spirituality. Yeah. Isn't Yoruba culture the answer? <laughs> you tell me, why, why so little Nigerians even follow it? No, no I use it as a paradigm, largely. Um, I, I, we've just spoken about dangerous religions or the dangerous paths that religion takes and which compels humanity, uh, human beings to take. And one of the beauties, I stress this at every opportunity, is that that is one of the religions in the world. I call them sometimes invisible religions because they're not much known about. One of the few religions in the world which has never gone to war on its own behalf, on its own basis, for the promotion of its ideas. Uh, neither a crusade, nor a jihad, nor the equivalent anywhere would you find in religious. It's a very tolerant religion, the religion of the Orisha. And despite that, despite its reticence, it actually successfully crossed the Atlantic on the, in the hearts of the slaves to the Caribbean, to Latin America, Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, Dominica, Puerto Rico, name it. Anywhere the slaves went, their religion survived in spite of very harsh reprisals from their, the slave owners. Not only that, this religion was so infectious that it syncretized with Roman Catholic religion and uh, the Orisha names syncretized with the names of deities, Saint Anthony, etc., etc. And that is why, for instance, I think the present Pope is going to be the, one of the most successful because it comes from that folder. From Yoruba. Let me see, maybe I have my calling card here. Uh, yeah, this, this Pope. Yeah, but your I calling card it. is about wine, yes, not about here religion. Here, here's the Pope, you know. <clears throat> and this is the missing ninth beatitude. Blessed are the winemakers, and that's the Pope, you know. Yeah, and what, what, he, do you, what do you he's have? He's a Yoruba at heart. What do you have with wine? Let's talk about your cards. Uh, uh, you, you once said, um, the Nobel Prize is not my most important prize. The, what, you, sorry. Mm -hmm. the Nobel Prize was not your most important award. Mm -hmm. You said you mm -hmm. had an award from an obscure sect of winemakers, and you said, this is more important than my Nobel Prize. Well, one says, Things sometimes tongue in cheek, <laughs> especially if you're rolling Just some check. wine in Just your mouth at the time, <laughs> literally. 
Um, and, uh, but it was half serious. I was uh, inducted into the uh, fraternity of St. Nicholas and uh, so many years ago, I've forgotten. Rabelais yeah, Voltaire we're, was uh, there too. Nicolas, you know, yeah. okay, I'm okay, thank you very much. And uh, among uh, the former members were, you know, literary figures like Rabelais, for instance. One is not surprised that he'd been inducted into a Hawaiian fraternity. But there are so many other philosophers and so on in that. So I felt really, really honored. And the ritual, the ritual was pure Yoruba ritual. You know, <laughs> pure Yoruba ritual. Which is? It was, it was. Um, I don't know where they stole it from, uh, when, but it definitely was Yoruba ritual. <laughs> is it true that you haven't drunk water for a decade and only wine? I just wanted to check that rumor. <laughs> That you refuse to drink water for a decade? Is that it's, true? It's not refusal. <laughs> uh, it, it's, you see, some people come to wisdom very late in life. I came very early. And I realized very early, intuitively, that wine is better for the human being than water. Okay. And the Pope still, has yeah. affirmed it. It's in that kind. Okay. We well, should get some. <laughs> yeah, he promised he was going to leave some wine there. Yeah, what but happened he didn't. To him? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to another poem, a bit more serious one, mm. unfortunately, about a migrant. The, uh, about a migrant. Yes, yes. Um, I remember one of the most um, well-known poems of you was Telephone Conversation that you wrote when you were studying in Great Britain. And um, in your memoirs, um, your last ones, you write how people would not come and sit next to you on a bus because you were black. Um, in that poem, you recall how a landlady was refusing an apartment because the, the, the one who was calling was black, and there's a very funny but also very painful conversation. Um, some call the migrant the new black of today. Um, mm. When you talk about um, today, think about Black Lives Matter, but also the Syrian refugee crisis. I mean, it's been 50 years that you've wrote telephone conversations. It's been mm -hmm. 15 years you talked about race. Mm -hmm. Has anything changed in your opinion? You know, <clears throat> in addition, in one of the early anthologies, it's not really cited, I actually wrote a poem, uh, actually had a poem published about the same time as the uh, uh, telephone conversation. There were two, one was the immigrant, and the other, the other immigrant, the long poem. It's not very often um, exhumed. And I was very conscious of uh, racism, of course, uh, both subjectively and as uh, an objective fact. I mean, we were living at the time as a student. This was the height of apartheid. And we knew that the basis of apartheid was uh, was racism, nothing else, otherness taken to the extreme. And the issue of feeling, the, Im the experience of feeling different for the first time in one's life, when I went to, <clears throat> when I went to England as a student, was something quite, uh, quite monumental uh, inside, in, in, on the inside. I, I find it very difficult to believe because, again, sorry, seriously this time, not just Yoruba, but many people, many uh, nation, nationalities in, in West Africa and in most of Africa are very accommodating. I grew up <clears throat> with uh, uh, white colonials, the colonial masters, with Lebanese traders, Greek traders, uh, we Italians, uh, uh, own construction companies, uh, at least were their buildings. So I, I never felt that they were, I didn't feel their otherness strongly enough. I recognized what they were, and occasionally we had clashes, incidents of, uh, of uh, race discrimination, you know, and they were put to rest very quickly. So now being thrust for the first time in a white society uh, and, and to have to accept the fact that others saw me and reacted to me in uh, with a kind of tolerance, condescension, 
bombarded with stupid questions, you know, ignorant questions. And uh, then actually encountering, I have to tell you this, for instance, it, and I say this only because I would read something like African smell, you know, et cetera, uh, dirty and so on. And I find it, <laughs> at least the British, they stank. You know, they, they really stank. And I found that there was a, a distinctive smell, difference of smell between what I was yeah. used to with human beings and the British. Yeah, you describe how both you think that the other one stinks. The, how do I describe it? Well, yes. no, no, I don't know. I just knew it was a bad smell. Mm. Uh, it took, took some getting used to. How did you now, react? You were young, you were brash. Mm -hmm. Nigerians are sometimes have the reputation of being... Well, I can imagine that racism made lots of uh, yeah, Africans aggressive, very aggressive. Not just... Not you. Not me? N not you back then. I think, um, well, I don't know if my teaming up with some uh, rather militant West Indians could be called aggressive, uh, but it was a sort of self-protect. Remember that was the period when, in fact, Africans would be chased down dark alleys. And when I used to come to London on holidays, it wasn't too bad up north, even though it was strong there. People would get up from uh, their seat in the bus, you know, to stay away from you. It was very, very clear. But in London, during the period which you call the Teddy Boys, the yeah, Teddy Boys, like the, you know, gang, street gang, and with a very strong re racist ideas, uh, sponsored by an intellectual like Colin Powell, you know, of the extreme nationalist movement, this was a tripos, a Cambridge tripos intellectual, and he was, a, he was literally a Nazi. And uh, his, after his rally at uh, Hyde Park, the Teddy Boys took strength from that, from that accreditation, and they would chase us sometimes down uh, the alleyways. And the West Indians were some of the most uh, uh, aggressive. They, they didn't take, you see, we thought we were princes, West Africa. We were exotic. Uh, but when the West Indians came, they came as labor, you know, after the war. They came as labor. And they were not going to take any nonsense from anyone, you know, and they, and they, they resisted. And I found it was better to be with them. Now, <laughs> even my fellow Nigerians, you know, so we had running battles in the streets of Notting Hill yeah. Yeah, during that period. Uh, so you can understand uh, that kind of aggression has been a response. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love the West Indians at the time, they, especially the Jamaicans. The, <laughs> <laughs> the Trinidadians, they were so British. If somebody attacked them, they would say, come in for a cup of tea and let's talk it over. <laughs> Not the Jamaicans. <laughs> you, you even wanted to be buried in Jamaica. You even wanted to be buried in Jamaica at a certain moment when, when Nigeria wasn't letting you in. You were looking for a grave. No, I didn't. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't want to be taken. To, no, I wanted to be a prince. But when it came to fighting, I preferred to be with the Jamaicans. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Immigrants, um, you have been in exile twice. Once voluntarily, once just for escaping debt. Let's put it like that. Um, still today, you are traveling. Um, you told me one third you are in the U.S. Now a little bit more in Nigeria. Um, how have you been coping with the fact that you are outside and away from your beloved and struggling for people that you are separated physically from? How have you dealt with well, that? Well, that phase is over. I'm now totally domiciled in uh, Nigeria, except, of course, when I travel to events like this. Uh, but basically, uh, there. but during that time, I... I refused to accept the second one. The second, I refused to accept that I was in exile. And I used to tell myself, oh, it's just a slightly prolonged political sabbatical. And it'll be over very shortly. And, uh, and so wanting to get back kept me busy, uh, mobilizing with other Nigerians how to combat and remove the dictator. Uh, I went to various places, I frequented Brussels, for instance, uh, to talk to the members of the European Union and... As a lobbyist. Hmm? As a lobbyist. Yes, as a lobbyist, and very often at their invitation. They were, the European Union, as well as some other nations, were very positive. And each time, 
Abacha, Sonny Abacha, was sending his ministers on a propaganda message. They would send me a ticket to come and confront them here. So whether it's uh, Brussels, whether it's London, whether it's United States, Canada, African So you had a group themselves. ticket with, with Abacha? The, they always send you and Abacha at the same time? No, no, no. They, they, they always invited, once they heard yes, that the, a ministerial delegation was coming, they would let me know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would even send a ticket and say that we know what this man is coming for, so could we have some members of your organization to come and counter them in the mm -hmm. assembly? So that kept me very busy. I was almost on the move all the time. So I didn't have time, much as I, of course, from time to time, miss the smells, the people. Uh, I, I, I was, I, co I continued being your family, in Nigeria. Your children. Um... Well, there was the chemist stage when I had to smuggle them out to, through a very difficult operation through Benin border overnight, wife, children, because Abacha was into hostage taking. We take the children and declare other journalists or activists wanted. So finally, I was advised to take them out. So we came out and I settled briefly, very briefly, first in uh, Britain and then moved on to the United States. Mm -hmm. Have you forgiven these leaders? I mean, I remember you writing in the open sore of a continent very viciously about Buhari too. I mean, you call him mm. with his man partners in terror, uh, the, the stupid salvationist duo. You've been shaking hands with him when he's president. Um, yes, 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 have, yes. You, no. you called him, we should be mini Mandelas and forgive him. <laughs> the the person who preceded Buhari was a disaster. As those who follow the news uh, from Nigeria, with all the investigations, the revelations going on, we realize what we are confronted with in Nigeria. Uh, we were going solidly bankrupt. Even the alternative economy was running to the ground. And this was because of massive corruption. And then there, were, there was uh, a form of conduct which in fact was making that democratic regime no better than a military dictatorship. I mean, many, many incidents. The soldiers were being unleashed. Uh, again, lots of revelation coming out about how they colluded with the former government to completely subvert the democratic process. Names have been named, some have been thrown out of the military. It, it was disgusting. And uh, then we had a parallel government in the shape of his wife, whom I called a shipopotanos. You know, it was an accurate description, because she was very greedy. And it's all coming out right now, so it's not just me talking. Now, Uhari for me, committed an offense which I found very, very difficult to forgive. And that was the retroactive execution of some young people who were drug carriers. I thought that was really uh, uh, the limit. And also, I believed at the time that it's very difficult for a soldier. You cannot take the soldier out of even born again Democrats. That was my fear at the time. And so, uh, when he, he contested three times, and each time I was totally opposed to him. But this time we were left with two choices, the massive corruption and the obvious potential looming bankruptcy of the nation. And then, on the other side, an individual who kept contesting, who felt that he'd been cheated in prior elections, and who, uh, I noticed, was subjecting himself to party discipline, because I watched the whole process. And finally, I, I took the position that, while I still could not come out openly for him, I felt a civic responsibility to ask the electorate not to vote for the, former, for the incumbent. It was a very, very difficult situation for me, personally. But there comes a time when I'm afraid you cannot sit on the fence. And that's, that's what happened. Mm.
And are you happy for the future of Nigeria? Is it a good thing? I mean, you've got a famine going on in the Northeast because of Boko Haram? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned Boko Haram because that was the other thing which, cre which created that, uh, that choice. 270 something school pupils were snatched under our noses. Not only were they, the Boko Haram people didn't just go to one school, we literally had assembled them. It was one of the centers for examination. So you had pupils from different states all gathered for these rabid hyenas. It's like we fed them this human food. Those girls could have been recovered if action had been taken within even up to two weeks, three weeks, possibly a month. The government, the president, refused to accept the fact that these girls were missing. I mean, we're talking about 200 plus human exactly. beings gathered together in one compound. They disappeared. Some escaped. They, their parents narrated what happened. The teachers said what happened. You had a president who said that. Nothing had happened. He had his wife who came out and was ordering the police and the soldiers to arrest those protesting and demanding action. And that person wanted to continue to be president of a nation. For me, this was worse. If one shouldn't compare negative, negatives, but this was worse for me than even uh, uh, a wrongful execution, because we send those girls to become sex slaves. I mean, it was obvious what was going to happen to them. To become slaves of Boko Haram, and business went on as usual, normal. It's, it, it, for me, that president should have resigned immediately. At least he stepped down peacefully, which he is something. He did that. That must be credited to him. He yeah. knew when his hour was up, uh, not even his wife could persuade him to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about shortly about your theatre. Um, you've always said, now you've read poems, but you said that uh, you preferred theatre and that in, in your heart you were a playwright. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why is that? Why is theatre mm -hmm. so suited? Is it because of, you like the dialogues? Is mm -hmm. it because it, you like it as a mobilization instrument? Mm. Well, first of all, I grew up in a highly theatrical society. We again, Yoruba theater, sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, I witnessed the ancestral masquerades when they perform. You know, we have both the sacred and the, the profane, secular masquerades, and they will perform. And uh, then there, were, uh, there was Yoruba traveling theater, Hubert Ogunde, uh, the Ghana uh, Traveling Theatre, for instance. Theatre was, you know, flowing across borders in West Africa. And uh, as a child, I performed. Uh, uh, my father was a school teacher, was a headmaster, and he volunteered me for one of his very early uh, uh, productions called The Magician. I still remember some of the tunes, and I, I played The Magician at that time. And I found that uh, when you're on stage, there's a kind of communication which doesn't exist you know, in other art forms, whether paintings, perhaps the nearest is music, of course, uh, but again, that's very different. Music tends to be depersonalized, whereas theater is very, is very, huma very human, very human. It's, you can feel the emotions of people on stage. And, uh, and there's a sense of one-to-one -one communication, you know, exaggerated, of course. So the theater spoke to me very early as a kind of medium in which I would love to, uh, to operate. That is, if I didn't become a pilot, if I didn't become a, a sailor, if a I didn't boxer. become a lawyer, if I didn't become a doctor, if I didn't become everything I wanted to become. So I said you became a lot. You became a hunter, you became a winemaker, no, not well, a what, what is it? consumer. What is consumer. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen pictures of you trying to teach winemaking to one of your grandchildren mm. or children. 
Well, that's the other side. I have a, uh, have a teaching streak in me. The subject just happens to be wine, that's all. But I, I enjoy teaching. And so. what about hunting? Your, your, your son, your first son, um, he, he told in an interview that you took his pet away because it was a, a pet in the form of a snake. For you, a hunter, why would, you, with hunting? why would you take his pet away? Because it was a snake. You shouldn't be scared of it. Why would you take water away? Sorry. You, his pet. He was a child. Mm -hmm. And he, he tells that at one day he was yeah. playing with a pet in the form of a snake. Um, as if you would be scared. You, the Aparo king. I don't know. Maybe part of it was... Uh, I was very much afraid of snakes oh, when I was were. a child. Yeah. So um, I, that could be why I was attracted to the idea of killing them, because they, 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 they made me afraid. Uh, but seriously, though, I, I think the, just the bush has a lot to do. It's 90% of it. I sometimes say I'm taking my gun for a walk. Whether I come back empty-handed or not is immaterial. Without It's the just, gun or without, mm. without meat game? Without, yeah, without game. It, it, it doesn't matter at all. I just enjoy being in the forest. As you know, my home is inside the forest. It's where I feel at home. Uh, very tranquil, very peaceful. Uh, I, I hate what I do to them, the animals, but if they're careless enough to get in my way, it means <laughs> dinner. Don't you eat meat? I do, I ah, do, well, with yeah. wine. Yeah. With wine. <laughs> Red wine. Yes. So I, do, I just enjoy being in the bush. And I also enjoy the fraternity. As I grew up and I would go out with uh, the traditional hunters, I enjoy the fraternity. I enjoy the rituals which accompanied uh, group hunting before setting out. Uh, when you kill an animal, there's a kind of homage which you pay to it. It's a small ritual which you must perform. The four-legged ones, especially, not the birds. You just take those home and kill them and cook them. <laughs> you go hunting with, with friends or with children or with... Uh... No, I, I, I've made sure that I've inducted all my children in the bush. Not that I forced them to come with me, but I made sure that they had a taste of what it's like just to be in the bush by themselves. And then it's up to them whether they want. I think the last time they visited on holidays, I assumed that uh, they would enjoy hunting. So I said, well, did you bring your shoes and so on? And I noticed that there wasn't the same level of enthusiasm <laughs> as, as before. And uh, they sort of dawdled along to please the old man, I suppose. After that, I've never asked them out. You know, they, you know that they wanted to be back playing those okay. shooting games. games. Shooting yeah. games. Yeah, yeah. 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 Something, uh, and I would these things which they these games where they play. Pokemon. I mean, they frightened me. My son frightened me one day because I woke up in the middle of the night, and there he was shouting. So I thought he was having a nightmare. I went there. there he was. He was playing with somebody in Uzbekistan. <laughs> you know, very strange, strange generation. Strange generation. <laughs> how, how important is family for you? Um, that's a very difficult question. I know. Uh, let's just say that I'm not the perfect family man. And, uh, but the family got used to it. I love children very much. But I love them when I see them at a distance. You know? <laughs> and, and when they're owned by other people and they're just passing through. And after that, I've got rid of them. But um, I generally care very much for children, you know. Right. And how important has been your family to you? You, had, you were surrounded by strong-willed women, mm -hmm. your mother, you, mm -hmm. you named her Wild Christian. How, how important have these women been for you as a man or even as a writer? Mm. I not only had a very strong woman for mother, I had an auntie, who, um, Mrs. Francis Kuti, who was very militant, And it was literally at her feet that I had my first taste of physical, political activism. Brilliant woman, respected her a lot. My mother was one of her lieutenants. Uh, the, when the women rose up and chased out, chased out uh, a feudal monarch who was very oppressive and was heaping taxes on women, there was a messenger between the various women's groups. 
And uh, I, I took them for granted in the sense that I felt that was their natural role. I've learned down to value them even more with the rise of uh, religious fundamentalism, which despises women, insults them, you know, just renders them. I'm talking about extremism now, not about religion. I'm talking about that branch, extreme branch of uh, religions, not just Islamic alone. There are born again uh, uh, sects of religion which forbid women to do this and that. I can't stand that. It's, uh, and each time I hear a canticle just relegating um, women to, to uh, invisibility and uh, to non-value, I, I, just, I just feel that they are, they're cutting off, uh, they're depriving humanity of its rightful, <laughs> its rightful possession, its rightful participation, and I cannot understand that. I cannot, I, I, I find it a criminal, abusive, in a very visceral way. Let me give you an, an instance of why I say I value women more, even now, more than ever. I was at a hotel in Abuja, uh, Nigeria. In fact, I was giving lunch to my daughter and her husband and one of our children, and in came a family. And the man, children, about six of them, everybody roaming free, you know, and uh, eating, you know, drinking quite happily, not alcohol, I assure you. But there was this woman who was sheathed from top to toe, and she would lift a flap, and a spoon would disappear in there, come out empty. So I had to assume she was eating because the food disappeared. And this went on. And I was so angry, I said, what's wrong with this woman? Does she have a communicable disease that makes her eat through a flap? Well, I felt they should be thrown out of the hotel. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but I'm telling you what I felt inside. That I felt humanity was being insulted. I don't give a damn what religion it is, but any human being should be subjected to that because she's in public. Just to lift a flap to eat. And uh, at home, I make apologies about it. This is what I feel, and I believe this is the debasement of what humanity should be. Mm. Thank you very much.